Uh, we're going to open up this meeting at uh, 6.30. My sincere apologies for uh, holding you all here. I guess we'll have uh, a mulligan once in a while. That's right. <laughs> yeah, total space. The kids on the soccer field. Um, yeah. Um, and we're going to um, first uh, open it up to a public hearing on our proposed uh, budget for next year. Um, before we do that, I guess you're going to give us a presentation. Yes. Okay. Do you need me to move? No. Um, I feel I like I'm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you might want to slide over so you're not blocking yeah. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, so, we're, right tonight, we're presenting the FY19 budget for Deerfield Elementary School in the amount of $4,720,882. An increase from the current year, this year, of $132,031, or 2.88%. The Deerfield Elementary School will also use other funds in the amount of $893,057 for a total FY budget of $5,613,939. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of the budget, where the money comes from, where it goes, and how um, we decide what we need to do above and beyond of what that what we did last year that makes a 2.88 increase. So everything we do in this district derives directly from the mission statement and the vision statement. This is at the top of everything we do. We are charged with building dynamic learning communities, one student, one teacher, one family at a time. We are going to create collaborative, engaging, and inclusive learning communities that empower students to become successful and self-sufficient participants in society. And this is really what we're about. This is the business that we're in when we're asking you for money. It's about our students, everything we do. So last October, I presented the district strategic plan to the school committee, and they voted it in. Um, we are working on, these are the things that, that we value, that we're working on, our instructional practice, assessment and data analysis, and our special education services. So you can see that some of the initiatives that go into the strategic plan are the highest quality instruction available. That's what we're trying to ensure that our students are receiving. That we're building students' critical thinking skills and ensure clear learning objectives. That we engage in the best inclusionary practices for all of our students. And that we have collaborative time around personalized learning technology and assessment calibration. In other words, we need to know how our students are learning, how well they're doing, what we can do to ensure that their learning differences are met, are they falling behind, are they, are they doing well. We need to have assessments and we need to calibrate. And so the teachers need to work together, particularly in the grade levels, to discern that. And then teachers monitoring student process. This dis dis district strategic plan is at the top of everything. And then it goes down to all the different schools for their school councils and how they want to do their school improvement plans and the meaningful um, initiatives and activities and action plans they make through their own school council. But this is what we are all about as a district. So it's really about the kids. So this is some uh, brief, brief data at a snapshot. Right now, we have 401 students. We have 88 students with disabilities that require a little bit more than uh, a little bit more services, maybe in speech and language, maybe occupational therapy, physical therapy, maybe some counseling. Uh, our economically disadvantaged is 27 percent. 27 percent of our population is economically disadvantaged. We have in the building medical and therapeutic uh, professionals, and those are our <coughs> OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language. Um, our teachers, we have 39 and a half full-time equivalent teachers. We have right now 30 instructional assistants, two building administrators, we are choicing in 76 students. We're choicing out only 20. And then we have six charter school students who are uh, here. 
So there's drivers in our budget that are increasing uh, and decreasing. And some of the drivers for our budget this year are salary-related costs. That's our obligation. That's non-negotiable. That's uh, $105,000. Central office expenses, that's $13,000. Health insurance, $10,000. Computer hardware, $15,000. Sewer charges. 5320 and transportation, $4,177. Some of the decreases that we were able to receive this year were um, electricity, $15,000, software, $6,402, testing and assessment, $5,000, and other SPED services, $1,560. So this is what uh, is driving our budget. So the overview is the town appropriation that we're asking the town is $4,720,882. That is what, the, what we're asking the town to pay. Now the town, and I haven't seen the cherry sheet, but the town does receive Chapter 70 funding, which helps with some of that cost. I would, I'm, I'm not positive what it is, but I, I think it's upwards probably probably up to about 800,000, 900,000, I'm not sure. So this represents a 2.88 increase or $132,000 over last year's budget. It does support our, contact, our contractual salary obligations. It supports operational increase in transportation, sewer charges, technology hardware, and our central office expenditures. We'll get into those details in a few minutes. But we also receive funding from school choice SPED Revolving, Early Childhood Revolving, Title I, and our SPED Grant. So we do receive funding in, from those items too. So when we look at other funds, other funds budget, it's not really revenue, but it's funds that we use. Our special education grant brings us $104,712. Special education pays for teacher salaries, instructional assistance salaries, and tuition to out-of-school, out-of-district placements. Uh, special education revolving, that is $79,016, and that pays for a teacher's salary. Uh, Title I gives us $29,242, and that's an inclusionary specialist position. Uh, early childhood revolving, $199,040, and that pays for teacher and instructional assistance salaries in support of inclusive preschool learning environment. So all told, uh, excuse me, so school choice, we receive $481,047. And that, of course, pays, helps to pay for classroom uh, teacher salaries and instructional assistance salaries. So the total of funding that we receive from our other sources is $893,057. So when we look at our proposed expenditures, there's really about four main areas it's broken down to. It's broken down by numbers. Jesse determines the numbers. And so administration is 15% of the whole budget. Instruction, which is the business we're in, is 73%. Other student services is 5%. That's your transportation, your nurse, and then building and facilities is 7%. So when we break each one of those areas down, even smaller, we can look at, oh, this is our funding sources. So our town appropriation and our Chapter 70 funding is 84% of the money that we receive. School choice is 8.6, SPED revolving is 1.4, early childhood revolving is 3.6, Title I is 0.5%, and our SPED grant is 1.9%. So that's the money that we have to work with, and that's where that money comes from. So when we break down those areas into smaller pieces, 15% of the budget comes from administration, <coughs> or pays for administration. So out of 15%, we have um, our district-wide information management and technology, 
That's 11% of 15%. And that pays for our <coughs> IT director, our, uh, our IT um, troubleshooters that come around. Our, we have a teacher that will help teach the teachers how to use the technology, provide techno, um, technology uh, workshops. That's 11%. The superintendent and business offices, that is, of course, myself, Patty, the bookkeepers that uh, prepare the, pay, uh, the payroll, the <coughs> purchase orders, and take care of all of that insurance stuff, or all of those pieces that need to be done for those that aren't on the town payroll. That's 19%, so 15%, and then 19% of that, 15%. The school committee and legal services, 1%. Tuition to mass schools, that is charter schools, and things like that, that's 23%. Building-based leadership and clerical services, 35%. That's in this building, the clerical services in the office, the, uh, the salaries of the administrators. And then insurance, retirement, and other adjustments is 11%. So when you see when you see the uh, administration, that's what's entailed. When we look at instruction, which is 73% of the budget, teachers make up 65% of that, as it should. So 65% of 73% goes to our teachers. Medical and therapeutic services, again, OT, PT, speech, that's 7%. Guidance and psychological services, 3%. Your instructional assistance, 15%. Uh, supplies, 6%, and then we have a curriculum, a special education, and an early childhood director, and that's 4%. So that's instruction broken down, so that's 73% of the whole budget is instruction. 15% is administration. So when we look at our buildings and facilities, that's 7% of the budget. Maintenance is 20%. Our heating and utilities is 37% of 7%. Our networking and communications, it's all the hard, hardcore wiring and the servers and all of that, that's 6%. Uh, telephone bills, those sorts of things. Uh, custodian services, 37% of 7% of the budget. And then when you look at other student services, that's 5% of the budget. 69% of that, 5%, goes to transportation for our students. Food services, 4%, crossing guard, 3%, and our health services, 24%. That's our nurse and our um, LPN that help take care of things. So, uh, all being said, it, we really appreciate the support of the town, the support of the staff, the hard work of the staff, the students, the families that, that come here and support our school. Uh, the taxpayers that will go and vote for us, for our, our budget, and just the, the continual support we receive. We can't do it without you. So thank you very much. I think Patty will get into some more details. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, did anyone have any questions of me? I'm sorry. Anybody have any direct questions right now for Superintendent? No? One? Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you know, I'm going through this budget here, and uh, all the uh, services and so forth are marked 01, 02, and 03, and I don't see anything to, to reference what those are, and it's particularly a lot of your professional salaries uh, are marked 01 and 02. And, uh, some of the contracted services are, you know, are pretty obvious what they got. But there's a couple categories that uh, you know, kind of curious as to what they might be. Uh, what so they, it's a, that's the DESI coding. So 01 means it's a professional salary. O2 right. means it's clerical. O3 means it's an other. O4 is a service contract service. Yeah. O5 would be um, supplies and materials, and O6 is other. Okay, because I think some of them had uh, a clerical as an O3 or something, or, or okay, what, okay, what was O3, I'm sorry? Other salaries. Other salaries, which is? 
Um, what I would put in my other salaries would be my technology people because they're not they're they're not professional salaries. We try to keep the O one to everyone that is like in the MTRS. Okay, under uh, general supplies uh, twenty four thirty. What would uh, come under the category of contracted services? Under 2430? Yes. Uh, no, other, over, other instructional what services. What page are you on, sir? Uh, on page, page 15. 15. Yeah, so 05, supplies and materials. That's what 05 is, is supplies and materials. No, no, contracted services. Okay. 04 is contracted services. No. It says 02 here. On page 15 of 30, where it says 2430, and the numbers writing across are 42204, 34300, 40,000, 40,000. Patty, 2440. 2440. Other salaries, other salaries, contracted services. Oh, All of them listed as 02. Is there okay. an error? I read out the wrong number, sorry. Oh, so so sometimes with it's, uh, when, it's, uh, when we get into the 2440s, the O2s in that case means to me, so O2, other salaries, and then I have to split SPED, and unfortunately SPED uh, is also two, <laughs> so it becomes a 2-2, two -two. so it's just a marker for me to know that I'm reporting other salaries in the O2 category, and I'm reporting other salaries that go under the SPED heading. So okay. it's like a 2-2. Two -two. Okay, so that would be, that, that comes under the contracted services? Right. So what we're so what in that in that for other uh, instructional services, that would be what we would be purchasing there would be um, if we have children in the building with vision impairment and we contract with um, uh, vision. Uh, I can't remember Perkins. the school. Perkins. Um, okay. No, the one that used to be in the Camden. Collaborative. Clark School. Oh, that's the deaf. Right. Yeah, right. Um, Perkins is the blind. So it's it's contracted services to help uh, to provide services. For IPs that we don't need a full FTE for. Okay. All right. I said most of them are kind of obvious, but there was a couple mm -hmm. that are just well, you know, what, what's that necessary for? Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions? I will. Um, okay. All right. Um, Patty, you sure, I'll just take us, why don't I just take us through where yeah. we were okay. and where we're going. Okay. So if we go to um, page 11 of 30, well first let's look at 10 of 30. This is our student and staff uh, data sheet. And on the left is our enrollment and we freeze the current enrollment as of October 1st because that is um, the numbers on which all of our funding from the state is based. And then down below our projected 2019, I do change that as we update our monthly enrollment report. So right now we have 36 students um, registered for kindergarten, 30 are residents, two are school choice siblings, one is a staff member who is looking to bring their child in, and we have one other um, school choice application on file which is not included in that 36 number. So right now we're looking, even if we our three pre-Ks are full, we're looking at um, 391 um, students projected before um, Principal Jem makes her school choice recommendations, um, and if she will, in any of the grades. On the right is our changing in staffing. Um, before, we're not asking for a new IA in this budget, but since the last time we did the budget, we had to bring an IIA in due to circumstances of um, an IEP. Um, and the uh, literacy specialist, that is our, us asking for a reduction of a 0.2 to bring that position to a 0.8. Point, just for clarification, uh, where, where you say October 1 enrollment, and it says PK 45, special ed 3. I assume that's 42 regular ed students and three special needs students? She, we, we hope that we have three classes of 15 and we hope we have, three is what we already know are coming with IEPs. The rest will come along as they turn 2.9 years of age. But, but my point is, that's just a total of 45 students. Right, because right, right. we're hoping we'll have yeah, three yes. classrooms of 15 uh, students each. That's right. 
And right now we know three <coughs> from this year are coming back that are on IEPs. The rest will come as they turn 2.9 years of age. So that number is going to go up as the year goes on. The right column. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and on the bottom, we break down our professional staff um, by their teaching credentials for which they are paid in their contract. So we have eight teachers in the building with bachelor's degrees, one with bachelor's plus 15, 27 with a master's, five with a master's plus 15, two with a master's plus 30, and seven with a master's plus 45 or CAGS. Patty? Yes. Uh, my name is Bruce Hunter. Um, when I add these up, I get 51. So I'm assuming that IAs have teachers' credentials? No. So the people that are down here is anyone that, that, is, that gets paid from the teacher's contract. So it would include um, teachers, speech pathologists, and nurses. So that was the difference in the number we had on the slide. Correct. We had 37.5 teachers. Three. Classroom teachers, but then we had that's guidance, that's psychology. Right. <clears throat> and that's then right. I'm counting down here anyone that is in Yep. That's covered by the contract. So she, so it would also be guidance counselors, psych, school psychologists, anyone that's licensed by MTRS Great. and is covered by the collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. Uh, so page eleven of thirty. Um, this year's budget was four million five eighty eight eight fifty one. We had the uh, collective bargaining agreement that had a two and a half percent increase, which increased this budget sixty eight thousand six hundred and twenty. Steps cost us 35958 Degree changes, $1,018. Longevity, $3,500. We have an allowance here for non-union increases of $5,156. Uh, the increase in the one instructional assistant position was $22,942. Uh, increase due to change of funding for two FTEs, uh, $64,326 and decrease due to savings on the FY new hi FY 18 new hires was 62,191. We're looking to decrease the literacy coach to 0.8, which would save us 15,038. Um, a decrease in salary for a vacant sped position. So we have someone that's leaving and we are adjusting their salary down to what, um, to what we consider the average, um, which would be a master seven. Uh, so that would save us 12,879. And we did have a decrease in the retirement buybacks of 6,339. We did have some other operational increases. Um, central office increased 30,423. Our hardware, 15,000. Sewer charges, 5,320. Transportation, 4,177. And that is um, the negotiated that's in the contract. This will be, the FY19 will be the fifth year. Um, this is based on a CPI index, which was 1.84 this year. Uh, we do have some offsets in electricity, $15,000. Our network and software costs are down 6402 and that's basically because we, every year we're continuing to um, narrow in as to how software should be allocated mm -hmm. uh, so that we're not just doing it by percentage. Some of them we do it like my learning plan, that's for teachers. So we're allocating that by the number of teachers in each building. Other things we're doing by the number of students in each building. So um, as Scott and I get better and better at allocating uh, cost, um, when we recognize that there is an actual way, a better way to allocate it, we've been doing that. Um, decrease in testing and assessment, 5,000, and other SPED services, 1,560. Uh, so total decreases would be 27,962, or a net change of $132,031, bringing the FY19 Deerfield Elementary budget as appropriated from the town to be $4,720,882. Uh, yes, Dr. Carey said during a presentation there was an increase in insurance of $10,000. I just don't see that here. That was, that's part of the central office. That's part of the, what, what was driving the central office increase is okay. the, ch the change in the health care. Okay. And it was also, um, we the school committees voted to have one food service director for all five schools, so that was added to the allocation. Okay. But overall, the budget de only increased, the central office budget only increased 1% from last year. Um, and that was because we made some changes. We had been um, 
what we're what we're doing is we're finally bringing the purchase orders online. So we've been carrying thirty thousand dollars because we were either going to go to the cloud, which was going to be a recurring cost, or buy a bigger server. And so we finally decided the cloud was not worth it. We bought the bigger server. So that was a thirty thousand, and we did that at the end of last year. So that was thirty thousand dollars that was the cut from the budget um, in central <coughs> office this year. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time to talk about insurance, group insurance, or wait until the end? Uh, you can talk about anything you want, I think. There's never a good time to talk about it. <laughs> no, there really isn't. Um, the town of Deerfield currently pays for all their town employees. Uh, FY19 budget projected at $1 million for group insurance. 66% of that cost is school related. In your school budget, there's no line item for that budget item. Correct. Um, $660,000 is a lot of money that should be included in the school's budget. It's included I in the I'm, end of the year report as money expended by the town on behalf of the school. Under, understood. Just so that the public knows the true cost to educate a student in the town of Deerfield, I believe it should be part of your budget. Well, if it were part of our budget, then it would have to, the bill would have to come to the school committee and they would have to sign it every month and the Hampshire Group Insurance Trust won't give you two bills. So that's the problem. Understood. And then your warrant cycle and our warrant cycle works on two different timings. So Barbara would be paying her share at one time and our share maybe at another time. Because this meeting tonight got canceled three times. So if we were paying our share of the health insurance, <coughs> She wouldn't have been able to pay it because they wouldn't have seen it, signed it, and approved it. <clears throat> she would have paid it and then been re reimbursed from the school committee. Because um, I have spoken with Barbara about this. And, and just part of the record, I would like to, um, for the public meeting, and uh, have you accept this uh, information as part of the public record. If I, we, Skip and I have had this conversation several times about putting it in the budget. But if we, if you look at our per pupil spending that is calculated by DESE, the insurance number is included in that. Understood. The, the issue, the issue is, uh, well, there are a couple things. But it's primarily, you're the, you're the one that knows your employees. Uh, and so the town, Barbara That's City, not actually true. I do not know one employee okay. in this building that's on insurance. No, no, because no, I don't, I don't see right. it. Well, that that's the point, and Barbara doesn't know anything about them. Right. And it seemed like you obviously have the situation at Frontier where you have the insurance program. It's not something that's new to you, uh, and at some point, we would like the school to take over. And, and I'm not suggesting you take a five and a half million dollar budget to find a way of, of finding six hundred thousand yep. dollars. What we're talking about doing somewhere along the way is giving you the six hundred thousand dollars in addition to the budget, or whatever the number is, and have and have you uh, control those costs. Yep. <clears throat> And, and it's something we haven't talked about. Right. So, so I'm just first of all, we won't get two bills. <coughs> we won't get two bills. We don't do the payroll, so we don't know what Barbara would be withholding. So there's a there's a break there. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's the person who's controlling the information should be the one that's a, that's doing that. And that's Barb Hancock. And I don't disagree. And that that is a problem in, in Hampshire Trust. Uh, but Barb does the payroll as well. We don't. We we calculate gross payroll. I don't know what Kathy Glime has for deductions. I don't know what anybody has. Mm -hmm. We don't see that. That's the town side. Can I just uh, ask a question? But the, is this a problem? One, one, last, one last thing, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> the, the salaries are in your budget. Okay. Just the, sal ahead. the gross salaries. And that's what we give them every two weeks is 20, their gross salary divided by 26. And then they process the payroll. They process the deduction. Mm -hmm. We don't. I, uh, my point or question was just to ask um, whether this is a problem that's being expressed as a unique problem to 
our town or whether this is something that's happening to all the towns that are dealing with this handful of trust. So and the reason for doing that is not to have a huge discussion tonight, but just to sort of see whether there's something so that's a broader problem or whether there is something unique that we should be trying to since I came here, one of the things I've been asking for is you're supposed to have an indirect cost agreement between the school committee and the town. Yeah. And in that indirect cost agreement, it spells out what the town's going to do for the school and we agree on the cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in any of our towns. We okay. should have had it 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and in that, and so when I first came here and I would ask the towns when I was doing the end of the year report, how much have you paid for health insurance? Oh, it's about 35%. Well, no, I need exact numbers. So some towns still don't give me exact numbers of what was expended on behalf of the school department. Some want the control of paying the bill and don't want the bill separated and coming half to school committee and half to the town. But I have been trying to get everybody to, to at least give me accurate numbers, and Barb Hancock does. She does this, her and Sarah do a great spreadsheet. The other piece that gets reported on a guess um, is part of the town's Franklin County ass retirement assessment. But again, that wouldn't be 66% because this is the, the who is in Franklin County is the lower end of the, the salaries, our instructional assistants, our, co our, our cafeteria people. So if they could, because again, I don't know the whole town payroll, so it should be the amount of the schools, Franklin County, to the total Deerfield payroll, and that percentage should get put on the end of the year report to truly reflect the cost of running a school. And though these things just have not happened. Mm -hmm. So it's a structural issue that mm -hmm. a lot of people need to work with. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. What was the driving, uh, was the driving uh, issue that you wanted people who come to approve the budget to know just what the biggest number is. Because they don't look at an end of year number, school what, report. What a truer number is. What a truer number is. And I, and I believe that the, the number there does explain the chart, the second page that I handed as part of the mm -hmm. public hearing documentation. Uh, explains in detail uh, what the projected for FY19 is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money, and I think it should be known by the, 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 directly the, the people that run the school, mm -hmm. more indirectly by the people that vote for the budget. Right. I think it's, it's a, it has to be a known cost. Because most people won't read the end of year. Nobody will read that last report. Right. And, and, you know, Patty's correct. She does need to put that information, to the, give that information to the state. And if you go online and look down through there, you'll see all of that stuff sitting in there. Yeah. And that's information that Barbara has to give Patty and other treasurers, town clerks, whatever, yeah. should should be providing. Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you for that. Apart thank from you. that uh, sort of perennial issue that comes up, does anyone have any um, questions specifically about the budget going into next year, any changes to the budget that anybody's curious about or? Anything like that? No? Okay. I've got, I've got uh, a couple, sure, if okay. you don't mind. Not mind. Uh, Do I ask? Or if you weren't expecting it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, last, last week, and I don't remember what it was Monday night, <clears throat> I attended uh, a meeting at Mohawk where they talked about fiscal conditions of, of uh, rural schools. I'm going to give you three copies of this because I'm sure that none of you are going to read it, but there are some, some pieces that are interesting. Uh, and, and I'm just going to throw them out. And uh, so give me a couple minutes here just to page through. One of the ones that they started looking at was uh, comparing rural district with all other districts. Now, exactly what they mean by rural districts, uh, they specify, but I'm not, you know, I'm not too sure. But the first two screens, and if you have one of these, it's on page five. Paraprofessionals per 100 students in all other school districts, it's between two and three students going back from 2008 to 2017. 
a little more than two, a little less than, than three. Per hundred students. Per hundred students. At rural districts, it's three and a half to four. Mm -hmm. In, in district per pupil spending, I don't know where this number comes from. You, you might have an idea, but the all other districts, in other words, non-rural, in 2008 it was 12,000 bucks, and it's about 15,000 uh, dollars in 2016. Rural districts were, give or take, 13,000 and 17,000 in 2016. So the cost of in rural districts, and I was surprised. I had really, you know, expected that the rural districts, I mean, if I'm looking at, at the eastern part of the state and saying 99% of the towns in the eastern part of the state should be thrown into that other right. districts, I know, this, I know the difference between salaries out here and salaries there. So I was surprised at those numbers, to With be honest. excluded, right? And is the Cape, Trevor's asking, is, was the Cape included? Probably. Cape I, is more rural. But well, I would imagine the that you'd have, to, you'd have right. to look at the definition. I'm not even sure Deerfield fits in that rural district or not. Yeah. Um, so, and, and it's, there are some other statistics, but basically it was those two in particular, the, the number of teaching staff and teaching assistants in rural districts is greater than it is in non-rural districts. Now, I guess if you're, you're a rural district with, with 75 kids in your school and you only have 12 kids per grade, that certainly would mean that your totals would be greater. So I don't know exactly what they are. But my point was, it appears that we have, on a per capita basis, a larger staff particularly in the area of instructional aids. Uh, I'm not sure what the number was, 30 instructional aids? I, that's a, you've been on the committee now for in excess of 25. I used to have the record, but both you and Ken have surpassed me. Uh, and what was it, maybe five or six when you first started? So we have, we've expanded the number of instructional aids substantially. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I would love to see and I would like to see you guys work on, on, on doing this and doing it without increasing the cost of the town, is including universal pre-K. We, I think, as a town, would benefit greatly from universal pre-K. It would be a great selling point to anyone, to business and industry, to say, look, we've got universal pre-K for your kids if you're living in your field. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so Rep. Mark has a has a Saturday if anyone's interested. From, I think from say it again. Nine to ten at GCC, Representative Mark is going to I think have another similar thing. Yeah, this, was, yeah. this was Senator Hines' uh, <coughs> meeting, but similar. If anyone wants to go to GCC Saturday morning, they'll be. Mm -hmm. Hitting this topic so again. Can I ask a Go ahead. Sure. About the report, I, I'd be interested in seeing the number of teachers per student that those other non rules because I, in my experience, they have more teaching staff in in the eastern part of the state, so they depend hmm. less on instructional assistance because they do a co-teaching model. And here oh. we don't do that because we can't afford two teachers, so we do it with a teacher and an instructional assistant. Yeah. Also, I'd like to look at the spend numbers. Um, what kids do they keep in the district? Uh, we have 88 kids um, that are, have specialized instruction, so I, I think there's other numbers that factor into it that I don't have. I don't know what our numbers were like sped-wise a couple years ago compared to where they are now. Um, so I think there's a lot of things. To, I think there's a lot of things to look at. I don't think you can look at straight data and make a conclusion from that. Right. We should get together and well, talk. The point about of the whole them. meeting, though, isn't it? As I'm not as right. intimately involved as you are, but is to is to talk about the whole sort of economy of scale and how in rural districts, you know, we we you, know, you have one superintendent for a district with maybe a thousand kids, and right. over there you may have one superintendent for five thousand kids. So. You know, and, and transportation costs are much more out here. So all those things are Trans pushing, are pushing our per pupil costs, um, yeah. you know, in a direction. And, 
Yeah. But it, it, David, it was the, the, the one piece that, you know, I'm at least familiar with is, is the fact that the salaries that we pay, <clears throat> yeah. and I'm for both instructional aides and for, for teachers, yeah. is I'm going to guess 10% less than what is being paid in the Eastern part of the state. Yeah. Maybe even more. I don't know. Yeah. So when I saw that number that says our per capita cost was more in rural districts than it is in non-rural districts, mm -hmm. that surprised me. I would have thought right with the cost. It would the cost, the, you know, the fact that payroll was greater in the eastern part of the state or in more in more. Uh, when they talk about in district spending, are they talking about non-state aid spending, or so just uh, the towns, the, pro, uh, the children, uh, that, the children that state yeah, aid? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you've they, got they me. They may have. Yeah. They, well, the other thing that I find between rural and bigger communities is. Rules try to keep their special education kids in dollars, district yeah. where they can afford to send mm -hmm. their kids out of district. Mm -hmm. And they pay those tuitions and their mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. towns are wealthy enough to pay the tuition mm -hmm. so that they don't have these high end need children in the schools. Mm -hmm. So then when so when you're talking about in district and out of district, that makes it that makes a big difference mm -hmm. as well. Because they're not including those fees that they're spending to send somebody out mm -hmm. in those per pupil costs. So, Patty, out of curiosity, and, and, and Lynn, uh, the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative seems to run a number of programs that deal with special needs, and I would assume those would be some of your out of district. Uh, you have no, to be a member at LPS or not. Is, but the point is, is there, would it make sense for cities, towns, and cities? Towns, whatever you want to call it, in Franklin County, Hampshire County, to to Hampshire Educational Collaborative, or merging in with the with the Lower Pioneer Valley uh, Ed Collaborative, to be able to take advantage of those programs. Would that make some sense? Well, we do that. We we're doing that now amongst ourselves, and we we work with the CES in Northampton and. Mm -hmm. The business managers and the SPED directors were getting together because we were, were trying to build a database to say, hey, we have this specialized program and we'll take your children. And, and we do that now. So um, here at Deerfield, we have, uh, I forget what we call it here. It used to be LEAP, but now it's, it's LEAP. It's LEAP now? Okay. So that's for one set of children. In Conway, we have WINGS, which is a behavioral program. At Sunderland, we have a program that's for highly autistic children. So we, between the four towns, we use those programs. Now, if we have openings, other school districts around here are calling us, asking us if we can take their kids because they know we're cheaper than a, a private 766 place. Mm. So we're doing that amongst ourselves already in Franklin County. The, um, the Collaborative for Educational Services in Northampton is the one that we belong to. And they have a program called, um, heck, it's Hampshire Educational mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And we do send um, some of our students in the high school mm -hmm. uh, behaviorally challenged students to heck, where they can get some real specialized. Different program. Yeah. But and right now, uh, and I, I think this is just phenomenal, is that we have no student from K to 6 out of district. Not one student. We are keeping them all in district. We do not pay one SPED tuition for anyone, I'm going to correct myself, yeah. pre-K to 6. <laughs> we, we take care of them in our own schools. Now, we do send two students over to Sunderland, Sunderland. to their program. Right, but they're, we're still they're in, in the, district. They're, they're yeah. in the, union, the union schools. Right. right. But there is a little, there is a little tuition. No, I, that's, that makes sense if you can, yeah. that's in-house as far as I can right. see. Right, right. Good regionalization. that requires one-on-one -on -one instructional assistance and they need to be um, shadowed all day with an adult because they'll either harm themselves or harm someone else. It's but just, I've seen the bills years ago for $100,000, and this is years ago, for one youngster out of district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. We just, this, we're having a little issue, and, and this is how this works. We're struggling for every penny, and charter schools, don't get me started, mm -hmm. and 766 is even worse, okay, mm -hmm. because 
the May Center in West Springfield had to move to a larger location. So OSD, the Office of uh, Service Delivery, gave them a, a, an increase. So we budgeted $110,000 and now we have to pay $116,000, which was not budgeted for. So right. our budget at Frontier is short $12,000 for two students. So we're paying $116,000 per student to go to the May Center in West Springfield. <clears throat> Plus transportation. But meanwhile, from pre-K to six, we do have that program, a very similar, very high quality program right in Sunderland. And so the students that would normally have been sent out at 116 per child, we send over there for, I don't know, I'm, I'm throwing out 28,000. I don't know for sure. Well, I, I mean, I, I've seen it go from the district here to Boston, or the youngster went to Boston Monday morning and came home. And uh, so you can well imagine that the cost of that, I said it was over 100,000 back years and years ago. So we are, we are actively uh, being very, right now being very successful in <clears throat> keeping all of our students at home here with us. Okay, can, um, can I just ask a clarification question for the gentleman who brought up instructional assistance and stuff? Um, just in terms of our trend line, my, my memory is we, in the last few years, we actually had to either lay off or uh, by attrition, so we lost some. And then we've had a, an increase just this year because we've had some noticeable behavioral issues in the younger ages. But is my memory correct or not that we actually are down maybe three or four from about mm -hmm. two or three right. years ago? Or am I? Yeah, you're right. I think I am. Okay. I think we were up to 45. I think, point. yeah. So I think that, um, mm -hmm. I can't remember who asked the question, but um, my sense is that, that um, yeah, when we were struggling recently, that that's, that's where certain um, typical cuts were made. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. David, part of that was yeah. school choice, was it? Was what? Part of that was school choice, was it, as far as numbers coming in? Uh, well, the population of the school is roughly the same, isn't it? I mean, give or take. Right. Yeah, right. And we're down class. But three or four years ago, yeah. it, it was not cost effective with the school choice we realized, I believe. Well, overall, we wanted to uh, make sure that we weren't uh, filling up a classroom with only school choice kids. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <coughs> and I think that had an impact on overall staff numbers? Um, yes, it might have, but not, yeah, we were too. I mean, we were presented with all the demographics about the decrease in population we had, and then it, it didn't it. decrease. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Um, okay, so is any, any other comments or questions? Specifically about the, the budget? No? Yeah. Yep. I have one more, one more budget question. Sure. Um, on page one, the last paragraph, <clears throat> it says um, due to the change in insurance, New Hampshire County, Hampshire County Insurance Trust, that um, this requires us at Frontier Regional School District in the towns of Union 38 School to adopt this new regulation and enter into negotiations with the teachers unions to negotiate a settlement regarding the planned savings. With the increased co-pays and premiums approximately 4.7% and et cetera. Um, other towns have already been through that negotiation or are in the process of doing it. Has the town of Deerfield and its school um, union 38 started of that process? Um, I know we at Frontier have started ours. Um, I don't, I can't, the, the towns are handling theirs themselves. Um, so I don't know what, the, I can't speak to, the, I know that some town administrators have reached out to me for some data. Um, so I know that it's on their radar that. Well, uh, specifically it says that um, unions have to have a negotiated settlement. So the, so the law states that if you change the plan, right. that whatever first year savings are realized, 25% goes to the union. And yep. then the, you negotiate with the union 
how that 25% would be utilized. It actually goes to all the employees in the town. It would go to anyone enrolled in a in, program, in a not program. every employee, just no, every employee enrolled. enrolled in a program just, that's not medics. Just as an example, the town of um, Waitley is, at least for the town employees, there's a payback of $7,000 for the town employees, and I believe it's for the teachers too, but I'm not, I wouldn't guarantee that. So I'm just saying there's a, there can be a, a significant amount of money that's going to affect your budget that you haven't included. No, it's included. I, I already have ours calculated. How much did you calculate? For I don't your... like to share that number. It's not public yet. I'm not going to announce it before I tell the union. We oh, have, okay, we, we, but it's in your I, budget I somewhere. This is out it's already in this budget. You yes. passed out tonight. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay. Um, anybody on the committee have any no. insights or anything? Good discussion. Sorry? It's been good discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, my agenda has us voting on this uh, later. Um, later today? Later tonight. Okay. But I don't see any reason to do that. Yeah, we have oh, to close okay. the public hearing. Yeah, we have to close the public hearing. Okay, so we're going to uh, close the public hearing at about, oh, how are our clocks these days? It's like about I've seven, got 718. 718. Make a motion, motion to uh, close the public hearing. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Um, Aye. Great. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. We're Let some people leave here. Take a breath. <laughs> Sorry, I have to hear again. That's okay. No, we can share. Totally out of it. I don't have any glass. I know, me too. I have any glass. I'm going to go back. It's How's, really your, how's your poor grandson with his highs and lows these days? He's pretty, great. He's pretty high right now, right? I voted for him today. Yeah. Did he get it? Because it was 41%. There was somebody else ahead of him. Oh, oh good for him. That post maybe from Allison Hill. I saw that. So it might have been. All right. Um, so let's bring this back into our meeting. Uh, and um, motion to approve the minutes from uh, the last. Make a motion to approve the minutes from last meeting. Second. Okay. Keep All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Um, Patty, I knew we're exhausting you, but financial statements. <laughs> First of all, I have to apologize. I ran these financial statements on 3 6, and I don't know why I never emailed them out. Because right, they did they, they and so I brought it tonight because I, I said to Lynn today, I'm like, Lynn, can you check your email and see if I ever emailed them? Because I, why would I have run them and not emailed them? So I couldn't find it that I did it, and she couldn't find it, so I said, okay. Um, so tonight... Um, At least you showed up for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I'm in, and I'm in Deerfield, so I'm in the right spot. Yep. Um, so... I know you haven't had time to look at it, so if you have questions, bring them next month. But you do have nine warrants tonight, and they total $108,798.73. And the reason this is so high is because we've kept the warrant open every time the meeting got postponed. Right. So we'll probably have nothing, almost nothing to sign for in April. Um, and Tonight's warrants contain our first reimbursement for our student activity fund, which is kind of exciting. So, guys, pull it together. Right? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> With a little help, it was a that's team right. effort. That's right. It's definitely a team effort. So, um, and that's all I have to uh, give you as a report for tonight. And then I think I had I had questions I had answered, and you said they were shifting some sub. The sub pay was up above. Yes. Yeah. So when when I know a teacher is going to be so, Desi has now required us to break out long term subs. Why they're doing this, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But if it's a long term sub, I always keep them in the teachers because I'm using the teacher who's out's money to pay for the replacement rather than using my sub money. Right. So right now, because I have Brenda. 
coding it correctly, it looks like we're over in our subs, but it's, we're, it's not our day-to-day -day subs, it's our long-term subs. Right. And I had budgeted the money elsewhere. Up on the end of the line. Right. Yep. And I don't want to, I don't like to do the transfers because when our absent teacher comes back, I need her money in that spot. And the only other one was the salaries of the, um, the IAs and the, the kind of classroom assistants and stuff was low. Are we pulling that from somewhere else as it's well? It's overspent? Yeah. And that is, um, we had discussed that in a previous meeting. So I if I, as right. I'm finding money saving, I'm pulling off school choice salaries and spending okay. them here. Okay. Yeah. So that it, so, and we're, it, that, and I'm hoping this is the last year we do that because what, we'll have the PO system in. Mm -hmm. So this year, because what happens is we get to the end of the year and then we find we have some money left over and then Bob Lesko has got to finish 15 projects times five schools in right. 30 days, and he can't. Right. So now I, I, I brought we'll it to you and time. said, can yeah. I just pull the salaries over from school choice to, so we can spend down to zero, and then if we want to do the projects when, like in August and September, we can take the money out of school choice. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. New business. Oh, I'll give you another it, sheet. Here. Yeah, is there another sheet? There's another sheet. Oh, yeah. Order. So these are policy Oh boy, I was looking at this and thinking we're going to be done. <laughs> no, Five we've minutes. got a, we got a bunch more. Okay. I'll give you all of this actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. I see that. So let's. Does anybody have any um, public comment about anything non-budget related that they want to bring tonight? This is our public meeting. Hello. Hi. You may speak. Um, so, in light of recent events with violence in schools. Um, I know that there's been some discussion about, um, you know, different movements that are going on around that and that, um, you know, Union 38 is not participating in that due to political reasons and whatnot. But then there was an incident the other day. Wait, um, you've lost me already. Uh, we're not we're participating in what because of what political reasons? Um, I'm referring to the walkout that was on March 14th. Okay. But when you say participate, I thought people did participate. No, but the schools, uh, the, school, the schools are not participating. Individuals were welcome to, but the schools are not um, doing anything okay. with that. Sorry, okay. Okay, so um, my question is, and I guess my comment is, um, there was an incident yesterday here at Deerfield, and um, it turned out to be kind of a false incident. There wasn't anyone in the building. But I was wondering if anyone planned on addressing with the students and of course, age appropriate ways, um, what has been happening, because um, I feel that some of the students, kind of their imaginations can get away with them, and then there's not really a presence of anyone in the school that's like an authoritative adult to say anything otherwise. So I feel like it's kind of ambiguous for them, and sometimes they need, you know, some, some clarity. So I was wondering if anyone has had any discussions about that or thoughts about that or if there's any potential to address anything around safety with the children so that they have really clear ideas. I, well, the only thing I would say is that I know that Trooper Carmile has worked with us quite a bit and, and obviously Chief, Chief Pachurik on, on kind of how, how we go about handling that. But I think your question goes more towards addressing it with the children themselves and not so much like how the staff handles a lockdown or a shelter in place and yeah. where we get the kids for safety, but more more <laughs> curriculum based. Right. right? Yeah. I, and I, I don't know that answer. So. Tali, are you asking about um, conversations around what's happening in other area schools? Are you, at, are you talking about this specific incident that happened yesterday? So I'm wondering if there's just been any discussion among the staff and faculty at the school about any ways to address it with the children or if that's something that has just even been talked about. Are you talking about the specific incident that happened yesterday or are you talking about what's happening in other schools? I'm, just, I'm talking about that's overall fine. safety, yes. which includes that incident, yeah. of course, but mm -hmm. because the children are participating in these lockdown drills, mm -hmm. for some of them that can be kind of an intense experience. You know, depending on the child, but I'm just wondering if anyone has talked about do we need to address this with our students 
to create some kind of clarity for them because a lot of the students do know about the recent violence and no one has really kind of said anything and I know that families have their own ways of handling that but I'm wondering if there's been any discussion about recognizing that as a school in any way so that misinformation that children are passing to each other is kind of clarified um, you know kind of along those lines just wondering if anyone yeah. has well, thought certainly that. from a school committee perspective, we're obviously not actively doing anything about it. Um, but I would, I would always assume and uh, understand that the principal would be constantly having these discussions with faculty just because they're dealing with the drills. And as you say, it's age appropriate, so it's probably very different what a kindergarten teacher might want to, how they might want to address it as opposed to a sixth grader who's on social media and hearing and seeing awful things. So. Um, I don't know, I mean, I would raise that with your principal or your classroom teachers um, if you feel like something isn't being addressed in your particular child's classroom. Um, but on a school-wide basis, yeah. I would turn that over to you as to yeah. whether it's... So there's different levels of um, uh, comfortableness, if you will, with certain um, students. And some families are not sharing anything about what's happening. And so we address it through our ongoing social um, second step curriculum and teaching empathy and um, that, that type of the piece that we hit constantly in modeling respectful behavior. But we're not bringing up certain incidents because there's some families that haven't talked to their children and there's some kids that have um, a trauma history that, that would in, that then engage and, and cause worry for the for those other kids. So we do. We have a faculty meeting coming up uh, tomorrow after uh, after school, and we'll be addressing some of the stuff that happened yesterday, mm -hmm. and working with that as a faculty. Um, Kathy, I don't know. I don't. I don't mean to put you on the spot, so you don't have to. But I don't know if you want to share anything that you, you talk about it with your with your class or how you address it too. Well, I, I do think that it's an individual family discussion because every family comes with a different background so we try to respect that. Um, as far as the drills taking place, you know we always start off the year that it's practice and it's good safety procedure to practice drills and we're, we do it in a very relaxed calm way so that the kids feel comfortable and then there's always um, a robocall that goes home so parents can follow up to see that if there was anything that popped up and then parents usually communicate that to me if something has made the, the child feel a little un, uneasy. And you do first grade? I do first grade. So. Well, um, actually, um, as an ad, administration, administrative team, we all sat together and we crafted an email that went home to all the families uh, in the pre-K to six. Uh, the high school's a different story because the um, activities were student-led. But pre-K to six, uh, we crafted this email, and I, I need to tell you that we, we got a lot of, I personally got a lot of um, positive feedback saying thank you for not, for not, you know, pushing this on my child. You know, I'm, I'm not speaking to my child about it. My child's in third grade. I'm not ready to talk about it. They, you know, he suffers from anxiety. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to do it with our child. So it's a fine line. Um, yeah, can I just kind of refine it a little <laughs> so I can be a little more clear about how I'm thinking about it? Um, I'm thinking about it more in a way of creating, I don't want to say a boundary, but a clear discussion, just like, um, you know, the police motto is if you see something, say something. So that students realize that um, it is important to, you know, not say say something that isn't true that does lead to having a lockdown drill, and to have just the awareness around that in more of a general sense. I guess is what I'm thinking of. Of course, in our second step curriculum addresses that with uh, recognize, report, refuse, and we go over. I mean, we're you know ensuring that it's accurate information. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes no matter how much teaching instruction we get. Uh, kids are inaccurate when they report for whatever reason it happens to be and you know um, and then we work with that because sometimes that comes from a skill deficit or a lagging skill and then it, it's honestly it's a in this case it's a cry for help right so we we are coming in and we're swooping in and and um, building skills individually for that student the, um, the the curriculum of second step has been yeah. around for 20 years 
and it is it was originally an anti-violence curriculum and the whole idea of second step is your first step is your impulse and the second step what we try to teach is sit back you know to take a second take a breath think what could happen if I do this how would I and and to come up with these other alternatives to that quick reaction and a way to speak to one another. I feel badly when you call me names, I, I need you to stop. And so that these skills are practiced over and over and over again during the school day and in all classrooms so that it becomes second nature to the kids. And honestly, I'm looking at Kathy Gleim here who does a lot of RTI service, which means that she pushes into the classroom and teaches perspective taking and theory of mind, which would then feed right into that of how does it make somebody else feel when your story is inaccurate. Um, and and it, it's not usually at this level. It's usually, um, it could have to do with, I don't, do you have an example from today? <laughs> uh, <laughs> To throw you a, uh, right, right. right. They're, they're usually right. smaller things like you know taking somebody's pencil and saying it's theirs. It's it's usually smaller, but we address this constantly throughout the day, um, proactively and reactively. So. And there is a, you know some children will there is a, a you know a, it's their fault. I did this, but they made me do it. I I you know I I pushed him in line, but he cut me. And and these are the kinds of skills that we work on, and that's why empathy. You, is the is the phrase is the word that we really focus on and you did the river rocks and that was a UBU project yeah what was uh, that was around recognizing differences and that everybody is part of the community so they all um, paint rocks but yeah. the idea of understanding someone else's feelings and and actually taking that perspective of your, to your own self is really where we're going to help these children as they grow to not use violence as an answer, to, you know, to keep their hands to themselves and to think before they act. It, it's, a, it's a training, but it starts right in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's a very, very well-renowned uh, curriculum. Uh, we've only had it here about three years, I think. Four years, five Since years. I've been here, three years. Two years? Uh, three years. Okay, so started ten, because I've gone through the two second, second. Oh, the bullying. Oh, good. <laughs> we <laughs> added the bullying. We added yeah. the bullying prevention unit three years ago. That's what. Oh, okay. That was the bullying. Yeah, okay. Thank well, they you. created it. They created oh, yeah. the force lessons of bullying yeah. prevention. And, and, yeah. and then they do the steps it. to respect. And it's, 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 it's a wonderful curriculum. Okay. I hope that helps. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay. Um, not that we'll cut you off if you want to pipe up later. But um, So that ends the public comment. Why don't we take our vote now on our budget if there's no more discussion about it. Uh, I, in terms of my discussion, I don't really have anything to add to it. I think that um, folks... Oh, I just looked up the, the cherry sheet number in the meeting here. I think it was about a million dollars. It's about where we're at. But I don't know. Is that split between, Patty, do you know, does that split between Frontier and here? I don't know how they proportion that. Where did that. you look? So, okay. I looked on. Um, it depends on where you look. Because if I'm. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, if I look at the Division chapter of Local 70, Services. So if I, and that could be total. And yeah, I think if that I is look total. It, and if I look, if I can pull up. I think if I look at their Chapter 70 profile, yeah. I think that tells me just Deerfield Elementary and leaves out Franklin <clears throat> County Tech and gotcha. Frontier. Gotcha. Is this so, number going to change the way you think or vote about this budget? Tim? Not at all. I okay. just wanted to add uh, two cents. It, uh, it does help people understand uh, where that comes from. You know, you're late. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, That's I'm not to keep it relevant. <laughs> Last one in, uh, first one out. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I think that. In full transparency, as we were talking about the insurance, the $660,000, we also need to know that the taxpayers do receive Chapter 70 funding for the school, which somewhere is, between 800 and a million. Which is That still takes off from the top. Not enough, but yes. you're right. <laughs> it's not enough, and we're working on it. I know. We'll see you Saturday. Yeah. We're yes. We're working on it. Good. That. Glad to be there. Okay, so I make a motion to approve the budget for FY. 2019 for Deerfield Elementary School at you know, the whole number in the motion. Uh, uh, the four just mil the town appropriation number. Which I think is the four million seven hundred twenty or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, four million seven hundred twenty thousand eight hundred and eighty-two dollars. 
Second. Okay, any further discussion? Sure. No? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. And again, thank you very much for all the work on that budget. Yeah. It was a little less painful than yeah. the last couple of years. Um, okay, so we have, for new business, we have a whole series of policies that we are sort of, uh, I guess we call it a first read through tonight. But in the interest of time, do, do, is somebody uh, tasked with just giving us the quick hit on each one? Or would you rather we just, this is our first read, we'll read them and we'll vote on the next one? Sounds good. There's nothing significant major, right? We're just sort of aligning them with um, best practices and what's being recommended from. We did all this, right? You were on the board, mm -hmm. uh, like just two years ago, I think. Yeah. We, we yeah. went through all this, and then yes, as soon as it was done, the Massachusetts some Association updates. wanted to kind of like revamp it again. So, okay. So, I'm just hitting on some of that stuff. So okay. You'll find that the, um, the crossed out is what we're taking out, and the red lettering is what we're adding. On that second page. So, yeah. when you read them, these okay. are the, uh, what the, the, the subcommittee recommends. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, principal's report? Sure. So we had our first um, family math night and we were delighted with the turnout. We had, um, we handed out 129 passports. We actually got a passport. So we had um, at least 129 students that joined awesome. us. Out of that, we had 75 um, students accounted for in a survey, and I say that because it's hard to tell how many families actually completed the survey at the end. Uh, and the numbers I shared with you at the top are um, how they were distributed throughout the grade levels. So we had representation through uh, across the grade levels. Uh, a little less in fifth and sixth grade as reported out, but again, we didn't count for the entire 129, we just had okay. 75. Um, it's a, you know, it was a, a wonderful event. We got a lot of uh, great positive feedback from families. Yeah. Um, in the event of time, I'm just going to highlight a little bit. We have a lot of classroom news. There's always some wonderful learning opportunities happening. So um, in pre-K, pre-K is continuing to work with the first grade classroom with the tinkering workshops. That kind of was inspired by some professional development from the Hitchcock Center. Um, first grade, they uh, had some Olympic celebrations brought to their class. That seems really long great. ago now. Doesn't it? I was reading this too, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, wow. Legged box sleds, yeah. they're awesome. Um, second grade has been implementing math workshop model, and um, that's where the kids are getting that small group instruction of running through some yeah. activities, and it could be either teacher-led mini lesson or dream box or uh, choices and games. Uh, fifth grade has been um, begun a realistic fiction sto story unit highlighting uh, learning differences, um, and the sharing uh, of diverse perspectives will contribute to developing skills of empathy, compassion, and acceptance. Um, band students are preparing for the second annual band fest, so April 10th at 7. If you need a place to be, it's going to be the happening place. Um, and students from LEAP are participating every other week in uh, Greenfield YMCA swim, which is um, a therapeutic time to swim, socialize, and work on life skills. And Spanish, they're really working on spring down here. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. <laughs> so hopefully we see that soon. Great. Okay. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Um, Kayla's not here for the collaborative. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything. Uh, Dr. Carey, do you have anything additional besides your budget stuff from earlier? No, actually, I, I don't. Okay. But no. thank you for asking. Yeah. Okay. You want a motion? Um, I'll take a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. 740. Okay. Thank you. So thank moved. you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.